All right, guys, we're going to get started. Guys and gals, uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, this time last year, we were still talking about this store. You probably thought we were lying about the new store, but it's, it's finally here. It's a little bit bigger. What's amazing is all this stuff was in that other little closet, ceiling to the floor. Uh, fortunate to have uh, good speakers here today, Thomas and Billy Aarons, and uh, Jeff Luger will come on second. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. You came to hear them, so um, we're going to... Going to uh, let you know who these guys are. They're the founders of the Shando University Bas Team Bass Club. Uh, what, two years ago? Two yeah, years two ago? years ago. Two years ago, they founded that team. Uh, they're from Loudoun County. And uh, I think what's amazing about them, they weren't like the Virginia Techs that have had the team for quite some time. And so they had very little time to, to get ready and get out on the water. Uh, but they did, I think, a lot of their successes, they may mention was contributed to doing their homework and uh, in just one year uh, they finished uh, the Cabela's poll had them ranked at sixth, sixth in the nation and that's from a that's a triple or a, a division three school yeah. matched up with a division one school so uh, they're good sticks and uh, they're here to share some information so uh, see what they have to provide here and if you have any questions feel free to ask them questions so Thomas and Billy Aaron so to add to what he said, if you guys have any questions through what we're doing, please raise your hand. Um, we're going to try to get through these PowerPoints as fast as we can, just so that way we're available to you to be able to answer any questions that you have. Um, you know, a little bit more about that. We started in fishing because of the Marshall Fishing Club. I grew up actually in Vienna. I was near the Beltway. And I went to this weird casting kids competition one time because I had a break between baseball practices and in an infield you know, facility. And I did pretty well at that. And this guy said, hey, there's this thing called bass fishing. And I knew the Potomac was there, but I knew, I didn't know there was fish in it growing up. And then from the Marshall Fishing Club, they got me interested in it, and I got hooked. You know, and after we did high school for a while, I kind of had to get into baseball and do some other things. But then when I stopped playing baseball at Shenandoah University, I was like, you know what, I, I, I really want to get into fishing again. And then, you know, through the, the process, I was able to get a club started there, and my brother and I were able to get back. Uh, my brother's story of it, through the high school stuff, he actually got to go to the Bassmaster Classic twice for his age group. He went to the Three Rivers in Pittsburgh, and then he went uh, to the one at Toho, I believe, the Harris Chain. Yeah. Um, and that was before when, when Bass did it that way. The first day you got to practice with your pro, and then the second day you actually got to compete in a tournament. Um, and feel free to ask him about that, but we've been basically, we fished down from Florida, and we've gone all the way up to uh, Maine and fished all over. We're not pros by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, we're learning a lot as we go. This is just kind of how we got into it and how we approach new water. Um, when we fished our first college tournament, we didn't have jerseys. Um, the school yeah. couldn't afford it. We went to Gander Mountain, bought two shirts, and we sharpied SU on it. <laughs> and then we showed up there, and we're, we're getting through this whole process, and you see Penn State going at rat boat, rat boat, and the first thing, like, there's no way. There's no way we're going to do anything. We should not have come to this thing at all. And we were so nervous, you know, get to our first spot and we start catching them. And we get back and realize it's not about the jersey. You know, it's not about the jersey, you know, it's not about the sponsors, it's about what you know and what you can apply. And to any high school angler out there, you know, you don't have to be related to Kevin Van Dam. you just have to have a passion for it. You don't need a million dollars, you just have to be able to study. And, you know, the one thing that we're going to break down in our slides, uh, what Jared mentioned, there's a lot you can learn without even winning a line especially now with social media with Wired Fish, Bass University. I've never been to uh, Lake Murray before, but I Googled it as soon as I could to try to learn as much intel as I could. So when I got to the water, I had a ballpark idea of what was going on. So, Billy, you want us to get started? Yeah. Let's see what we got here. All right, so we're going to start off talking about new water and how we approach it and break things down. We're going to use a little bit of our experience from some of the tournaments that we've fished. And we're going to also break down some of the water in this area, like Lake Anna and the Tidal Potomac. Uh, and then we're going to move on to how we practice on those different bodies of water. We're going to talk about lakes versus rivers. And honestly, just the technique and what goes into two people being on the boat, fishing on the same team for a tournament, and, and how you would approach that. And then we'll also talk about some lures when we run out of things to talk about. So basically, fishing new water intimidates a lot of people. And for good reason. When you look at a lake the very, very first time, you are told where your, your tournament's going to be. You pull up a map, you look at it, it's some odd square acres. Murray was several thousand. Uh, it was an ocean. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> enormous. But uh, you, you break it down. You, you don't look at it as an entire lake. You, and what the next slide? 
All right, so your first decision is you have to figure out, are you fishing a lake or are you fishing a river? Because there's different things that goes into each one. And once you figure out if it's a lake or a river, you have to really get into your homework. study. If it's a river, you got to look at your tide charts. you got to figure out what the locals are talking about. You know, are the fish spawning? What time of year is it? All these other things. And we'll talk, we'll talk about briefly each of those things as we go on. Um, but there's a lot of things you got to do before you even get to the water. And there's a difference between pre-practice and practice. Pre-practice is something you do a couple months before the tournament. Once the schedule comes out, you know, you start doing your basic research on the body of water that you're fishing. And you kind of just get an idea of what you're going to be doing when you show up to the body of water for your actual practice. Uh, so ideally what you're going to do is you're going to go down and after you've done all your research, you've collected your information, you'll go out on the water and you'll just try to catch a couple. Just get a feel for the, the rhythm mm -hmm. of the lake. And that's really what your pre-practice is in a nutshell. Your practice is different. You're, you're trying to, like the day before the tournament, you're trying to figure out exactly what you're going to be doing the next day. So, uh, that's kind of cutting it off a little bit, but whatever. We'll make a deal. Uh, so, pre-practice, there's a lot of different things to consider. You got weather. And the weather has to do with wind, precipitation, temperature, you know, the trends, is it warming trend, is it cooling trend, all these other things. You know, the type of forage in the lake, Murray was a blueback lake, that's mm -hmm. totally different from a lot of the lakes in this area that have like threadfin shad or something like that, or other lakes that don't have any shad at all, maybe it's bluegill or perch. You know, so forage is incredibly important because that, that'll tell you where the fish are setting up. And then the species of bass that you're targeting. There's largemouth, there's spotted bass, and there's smallmouth, and all of them behave differently. So you got to figure out what types of bass are in the lake that you're fishing, and that'll help you approach them coupled with the forage. And topography of the lake, Murray had a lot of clay points. Lakes in this area, uh, you go down to Clater Lake, it's kind of just a canyon reservoir, just sheer faces on either side. Anna is a little bit more gradual in most areas. Uh, actually have not fished Smith. So. No, I mean, yeah, and Smith fishes a lot like a Highland Reservoir. When we went to uh, Indian Lake up in uh, uh, Ohio, and that's where we actually finished second, our second year, I mean, a lot of stuff you can do, Google Maps. Like, before you even get to the lake, I can know where docks are, I can know where points, I can know where my clay points are, I can even look for bushes where the water is a little bit clear. All this information I can get on Google. And so, even before I get to the lake, I'm going to compile as much knowledge as I have of this place so I kind of have a basis of what I'm dealing with. A big thing Billy mentioned was like the blueback. You know, a lot of the South Carolina uh, lakes, they have a blueback, which is a very pelagic bait fish species that completely changes the fish. And that was the, like the second tournament in my life I left the state of Virginia. And I get down to the national championship, I'm flipping docks, and there's no one on dock. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on here? Well, I didn't know about the blueback. I didn't know that this species actually affects the fish and makes them act a lot like striper, where they're going to follow the bait no matter what. And if it's 30 degrees, it doesn't matter. Those fish will bust on blueback in that cold water. Had I tried to probably Google a few things and figured that out beforehand, that might have helped us out at our first national championship a little bit. But again, that's just a little bit of information you can just start putting in your toolbox that can help you once you get to the lake. You want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Other things we got, types of cover, research types of cover we got, you know, does it have a ton of docks or is it wood or what do you got? Uh, water clarity, obviously important. Tides, not important for lakes, very important on rivers. Is that the, oh, time average of year. weight. That one. Yeah, oh, we'll just skip ahead. One. Average weight. If you're going into a tournament, you have to figure out what weight you need to win because that's going to change how you fish. If you're mm. fishing a lake, or if you're fishing Anna, for example, and you know that you need 18 plus to win this time of year, then maybe you're not going to be throwing something that's incredibly finessey and going for two, three pounders, because you need hogs, and you need a stringer of them. So maybe that's something where if it's a one-day derby and the pay doesn't go down past third place and you need to win, you know that, that affects how you're going to be fishing. Now, for us, a lot of the tournaments that we fished, we were fishing to get to the next tournament, mm -hmm. which we had qualifiers. We had invitationals, and then we had regionals, and then we had the national championship. You had to be in the top 15 for each cut. And then regionals, you had to be in the top 10. And the national championship, you needed to be in the top 10 to get to the final day. So we were fishing for cut weights. So that's a little bit different than you're fishing to win weight. So you got to keep these things in mind, and, and you got to know 
what that lake offers and what the weights are for that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that's important. And a cute little thing, but it gets cut off too. So basically how we practice, you can see that's the map of Lake Anna. Uh, and it's a lot of water, but it's only a lot of water when you look at it as a full lake. And what you got to understand about lakes is there are different ecosystems in the lake. It's not just one big body of water that's all the same. It's different. The bottom half is different from the top half and the middle is different. So what we do, and again, this is just our opinion and our experience of what we do for practice, is we like to break things down into sections. And I wish you could see it, but no, nah, it's not the projector. All right. Yeah. I could see if I could adjust it, but anyway. So we can see the top half and just visualize that that's happening for the rest of the lake. <laughs> we actually buy topographical maps of the lakes that we're going to be fishing. And we usually buy two of them, one that we scribble on and everything, and then the other one so we can actually see the contour lines. So what we do is we take lines, we take uh, post-it notes or what have you, and we actually mark sections of the lake. OK, so we have section one is the bottom, section two is the middle, section three is the top, and so on. You know, some lakes are bigger than others, so you have more sections. Now, then what you can go through and do is break it down into those things that we just talked about earlier. So what's the dominant structure on the bottom half? So the bottom half on Anna has a lot of docks. It has a lot of docks and it has a lot of points. So that's something to keep in mind. And the clarity, it's incredibly deep at the bottom. On top of that, it's really clear. So you know going in that you're probably not going to be, I don't know, throwing a buzz bait you know, off of a point, and I don't know, maybe the fish are coming up, I don't know. But it's important to keep in mind that the water is different in the different sections. In the middle of the lake, it's different than the bottom. The top of the lake is actually much shallower. It's stained, and there are a lot of bushes. There aren't that many docks. Some of the docks that there are, they actually have wooden poles, whereas the bottom of the lake, they're all floating docks. These are all things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you slide. want to speak to that at all. Oh, we got plenty of slides. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Hey, we can actually see that one better. Okay, okay so it's one. broken down. Yeah. And they're actually laid out all the different things for the different sections of Lake Anna. You see, there's actually a nuclear power plant in the middle section of Lake Anna, which actually warms the water. So the water temperature is going to be much warmer in the middle half, which is going to affect the time of year that the fish spawn on the top half versus the bottom half. So a lot of different things going on in the lake at different times. Yeah, fish fast effectively. Um, this is the one thing I really learned from practicing. You know, when I was in high school, when I first started doing college the very first year, um, I was, I, it was beaten in my head that you got to fish a spot as long as humanly possible. That, you know, look at that one guy on the lake, he hasn't moved, and he always catches the biggest fish. And I literally applied that when I would go to Chautauqua or Lake Indian or Murray when I started practicing. All right, we've got to fish these three docks, and we've got to fish in the best of our ability. I never got anywhere. And I might catch one or two fish, but then come tournament time, I didn't have enough space. And so what I really learned that the way you practice and the way you fish a tournament are completely different. I don't need to catch every fish in the lake when I'm practicing. I need to cover water and find out what some good areas are. It's easy in a tournament, especially on a lake, you can blow through some spots really quick. And you might think, oh, I got three good spots. That might take you an hour in a tournament and then you're done. And you're like, now what? We got some time to kill. And so being able to get out there and pick your baits that you can cover water with and find out where the fish are what the best pattern is, especially for lakes, pattern fishing is really important. You can find out where they are, what depth they're at, what stage that are they're at, and then from there, once you've got your areas, then you can switch it up in a tournament. There's been times that I'm burning a jerk bait, looking for spot, finding the key areas, but then come tournament time, I'm not throwing a jerk bait. I used the jerk bait to find them. They showed themselves. I knew there were a couple of good two pounders here, but then I'd come back and I'd, sh I'd soak a jig or a shaky head come tournament time. But had I just done the shaky head or the jig, I might not have gotten as far and found out all these key little areas. And, you know, and that's a big thing, like if you guys like to throw jigs. Jigs are a great bait. I've caught tons of fish in them since high school. I can't cover as much water and see as many fish as I can if I just do a, a D-bomb or something like that. I can get a couple of fish to hit a D-bomb more than probably a jig. I always have a jig on my boat, but mostly like in the summertime when I'm doing tournaments like that, I'll usually be pitching and flipping a soft plastic of some sort because I'll get more bites and I can go a lot more efficiently hit all the areas, and then I can transfer to a jig if I think I can get some bigger bites in a tournament. Switch to the next slide. Now this, this was a GPS picture that we took from our Indian Lake tournament, the one we did. 
we covered the whole lake in a day and a half. This was one day. This oh, was, was our one first day, day of yeah. practice. Um, we burned the whole, uh, we burned all the gas in the boat. We had to fill up again. We were able to cover the whole lake, and part of it, did we fish? Yeah, we fished. But we were just driving around getting a look for it. It was one thing to Google map it and look at it, but it's another to get in there and just drive and take a look. And so when, when we say fish with a sense of purpose, that's kind of what we mean. Don't get caught into one thing. If you catch two fish off a dock right here, that's awesome. You want this fish later. Move on. Can you duplicate it? You found a brush pile on this point. Well, there's about 92 other points in this lake. Are they on those? Is there something specific? So don't get bogged down catching the fish in practice. It's more about trying to figuring them out. So when the tournament comes, you can take modifications one way or the other once game day hits. And talking from experience, we uh, talked about different things to break down a lake. And one thing we did in this tournament on Indian is we went on Google. We Googled what do people win tournaments on here? and we Googled the weights that they were winning. Well, turns out Indian Lake, a winning weight is about 12 pounds. It is not a great fishery. <laughs> In fact, I'd, I'd argue that it's, it's bad. So another thing we found out is the majority of fish are caught in lily pads because there's actually a nature reserve. You look at the top right-hand corner, that whole thing is lily pads. It's just big lily pad fields and there's canals and all this other stuff. Another interesting thing that we didn't know until we showed up the entire lake is five feet deep, everywhere. Yeah. The middle of the lake is five feet deep, up against the bank is five feet deep. It's a pond. It is a massive pond. It's like the Okeechobee of the north. And that stuff I didn't know about until we got there. And what everyone, what all the information told us is like, oh, you got to get in the lily pads. You cannot win anywhere on the system this lake but the lily pads. Well, all right. Well, we spent like, what, a day fishing <laughs> lily pads. We didn't catch anything. We saw other people doing it, but we couldn't. And so that's not what we were comfortable with doing. So it's like, all right, let's go find something else. And so we started fishing rock. And then we kept fishing, fishing, two pounder. All right, let's go fish some more rock. Another two pounder. It's like, all right, oh, and then we caught two fish really easily. And there's like, and we looked around, there's no one fishing the rock around here. It's like, well, you know what? We might not be able to win doing this, but we're comfortable doing this. Let's find all the rock. And so what we did is we started looking. And what happened is because the way this is built, because of flooding is really bad there, they actually lined most of the lower part of the lake in rock and riprap. The whole outer side is riprap. So what we did is we just tied on crankbaits and we just hit as much rock as humanly possible in two days. And every time we got a bite, we'd waypoint it and we'd come back and we'd use our graph and graph back and forth and say, why was that fish there? And what we found out is when they dumped the gravel, there were some parts where that gravel spit out just a little bit more. And so we kind of took and we took and we fished every single piece of rock in the lake and from there, we found all the submerged little points that were there. And then we just ran those in the tournament. Yeah, there, there ended up being nine places on the rock where it jetted out a little bit more. And in the tournament, it took us an hour and 15 minutes to fish all nine of them. And in that time, we caught a limit and called four times. And we ended up coming in with about nine pounds, which doesn't sound like much, but a week and a half before the tournament, the worst storm in the history of Ohio, rain-wise, came through, and it actually went over top of the dam with flooding and flooded the entire town underneath of it up to about four or five feet of water. So everybody had to evacuate the town outside of it. So, there we go. And so the entire lake was muddied up, and the lily pads were not effective. The most people caught in the lily pads, one team caught a limit out of the lily pads. One team. The rest of them came in with two or three fish. And all of them were in the lily pads, except for two boats. Us and the one team that beat us were fishing rock with a crankbait. Everybody else was in the lily pads and they were just listening to the doc talk and trying to do the same thing that everybody told them to do. So it, it's important to kind of think for yourself and get out there and kind of just get a feel for the water. What we got? All right, fishing as a team. Uh, this is a, I don't know if you guys are Nationals fans or not. I am. So when uh, Papelbon tried to strangle Bryce Harper, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so I decided to put it on here and, and illustrate that that's not what you want to do as a team. You, you generally don't want to choke each other out. Uh, I, I'm sure there would be a case where it would come in handy, but usually not in fishing. Which one you got here? Uh, the main point I wanted to convey with that is that you're going to be on a boat with each other for, you know, eight to ten hours. So you got to get to know the person and you got to talk with them because if you hate the person that you're in a boat with, then you're going to end up trying to strangle them out. So mm -hmm. 
I would recommend communicating a little bit. And, you know, actually, I just, I just kind of skipped the slide. All right, yeah. so going with teamwork, we're going to talk about positioning. That's both boat positioning and how you want to position yourselves in the boat when you're fishing together. And we're going to talk about the pace that you can keep up and how one person sets the pace in the boat and the efficiency that a good pace brings when you're fishing as a team. We're going to talk about casting, communication, and then get a game plan that goes along with it. All right, no, I'm I'm about skip one. I keep skipping it. There it goes. Casting. All right. All right. So casting, there's a couple things to avoid. One, you don't want to hook your partner. <laughs> it has happened a couple times. I'm not going to lie to you. You spend a lot of time in the boat with the person, some things go wrong. Uh, in our first regional on the Potomac, I almost got knocked out by an ounce jig that he was casting. Um, but luckily I was wearing a hat and it caught me in the side of the thing and threw my hat in the water. But sat down for a little while, got my bearings and we were good. Uh, to avoid that, you need to constantly be aware of where your partner is. Now for us, we like to both stand in the front of the boat, which I highly recommend and we'll talk about later. Mm. And one of the reasons for this for casting is the bait is usually six to seven feet away from you. Now, if your person is standing really close to you, chances of hooking them go down. There's a reason you don't usually hook yourself when you're casting. It's because the bait's really far away. Mm -hmm. Now, if the person is standing on the, on the top deck with you and they're further back, you stand a much higher chance of hooking them just because the bait's further away, you know? So, it, it makes sense. You go to the boat Yeah, position. another thing with casting, uh, you got to communicate yeah. on where you're going to be casting because you don't want to both cast the same spot at the same time and snag each other's lines. That's really annoying. You also really don't need to hit the exact same fish if you're sight fishing. Uh, that's another thing you got to do. So in the situation here, he was fishing. This was also Indian Lake. We were cranking riprap. Uh, he was fishing along the riprap going straight, straight ahead of the boat, and I was casting parallel to this little cut. Okay, I ended up catching a fish, I think, on that cast because this was pulled from our YouTube channel. But that, uh, that goes along with communication. We didn't both cast the same direction on the riprap. There was a point where we could cast two different directions, and that actually saves time because now I don't need to cast that way because he did. Positioning, posi this is something that I see a lot of the college guys and even some other individuals try that they don't quite understand. The positioning of the boat, the boat is an extension of your being and your body. And if you don't have the boat set up right, you're not gonna have a good angle. A lot of times when you're fishing the bank, a lot of times you wanna cast the bank and bring it back. The problem is you're not keeping that bait in the strike zone a very long time, especially if you're trying to move something that's with a reaction, let's say a crankbait. If you know the fish are in five feet of water and you're casting to the bank and pulling it back, that bait is in the five foot for just a split second. If you parallel the bank, you can adjust with just your rod and keep it in one level of the water column the whole time. And especially when you're fishing with a team, like this middle photo here, what we're doing, this is at Lake Kiwi, we're pre-fishing. I'm fishing a crankbait, and I'm keeping my rod pointed right towards the riprap. Billy's fishing a jerkbait. We are efficiently, I'm able to hit the rock, and he's able to catch any suspended fish in those two water columns the whole time. And the key was, by putting that boat almost on the rock, by just adjusting our rods, we can adjust the strike zone. If you're using a seven foot rod, and you just move it over here a little bit, you can adjust what strikes in your baits in. And so a lot of times when you're hitting the bank, instead of just looking at it and casting pull it back, get your boat almost up on the bank and get both people in the boat. That way as I'm going down, I'm being very efficient and I can hit every single water column until I get a bite. If I get a bite out here, okay, where's that bait running? Okay, we're in six feet of water. Well, the bank's three. Oh, there must be a little break there. So they're on the break. Well, now I can move over and I can keep firing right down that break the whole time and I'm keeping my bait in the strike zone. I'm being very efficient, I'm not wasting time. And this goes back with boat positioning with both of us in the front. If Billy and I are right in the front here, and I'm in a hard wind, this is real easy for me to keep my foot on the trolling motor and give us both an angle. If I have a target here and I have to go broadside with that boat, the wind is just gonna kill it. And if anyone runs power poles or talons, you know, with those in the back, it's hard for him to cast as well. If I get him up here with me, we can be very finite and pinpoint hit every target efficiently. And if I have an issue where I have to either deal with a fish or something in my reel, boom, he's right there. He can take the boat right away. So boat positioning, being able to work together on the front. I mean, this person right here should just be like your spouse. I mean, there's been so many tournaments where Billy and I are like butt to butt together and we don't have an issue. 
If, we, if we're going to move a rod, bad cast, boom, right over him, he yep. can keep fishing, no problem. And, and I take the trolling motor. <laughs> and then if, it's also about casting angle. I fish lefty. I happen to fish righty, so I'm usually off to this side fishing while he's off to this side fishing. We both cast the same way, which creates issues, but one thing we did at Indian and we do on most situations where we have riprap, I make my roll cast out in front of him, okay? Then when I'm about halfway back, then he steps to the side, <laughs> and he I makes a roll cast past me, and then I get back to the boat, we rotate. And we just do that the whole way. We can make one pass right through there and the bait's always in the prime area. And, and yeah, go ahead. I mean, Sorry. it's awkward at Both first, excited. but we've been fishing together for like, what, f forever. Uh, but tournament-wise, for about three years. And once you get used to fishing in the front of the boat, it's, it, you don't even have to communicate with each other. And it's just, it's so efficient, and that's what I love. I fished in the back of the boat where we're a team, but it's awkward. It's like we're two different people. We're, we're, we're in two different games. And if you're trying to move that boat around to give him good positioning, it's a lot harder. But boy, when you're both in the front of the boat, it is so easy just to go through an area, pick it apart, and move right to the next area. Go to the next slide. All right. And speaking to that, fishing in the front of the boat and us paralleling our cover, you'll kind of understand that we're generally fishing similar techniques. We're, we're generally either fishing moving baits or flipping. We're generally yeah. not doing one moving bait and one flip. And the reason for that goes back to pace that we talked about earlier. And what we mean by that is you have a pace setter. The person on the trolling motor controls how fast the boat goes. Now, if I'm using a moving bait, I don't want to be on 10. I don't want to be making the same cast at the same spot eight different times with a crankbait. You know, I want to move. So, the efficient way to do that is not have the person in the back of the boat flipping while the person in the front of the boat has the motor on 80 going forward. You know, then you're going to make one flip mm -hmm. and then 30 yards away you'll make another flip. That just doesn't make sense. And you're dragging the bait behind the boat and that's just weird. Great example is based on this photo right here. So, uh, we got this is a at Chautauqua, uh, the third time up there, and we're and we're hitting some lily pad fields. Usually, what you do is the guy in the back of the boat might be throwing a frog, and another guy up in the front is pitching. Well, for the guy up front to be efficient, he's going to have to make probably three to four pitches to go all the way back up and start at the point and work back just to find out where they are. So what will happen is he's going to have to make three or four flips, and then you're throwing that frog three or four times in the same area. Okay, our strategy is all right. If I'm in the back. I'm going to hit the back half, you hit the front half. We make two flips and we go right through there, Brrr, we're done. They're not on a flipping bite. Okay, we can throw that away. We can go to the frog. So the, our thought process is how efficient we can be. If we do it this way, we will know if they're flipping or not. Because we've literally picked that whole mat apart, doing it either two different types of flipping baits or something like that. If that doesn't work, okay, maybe we can adjust to a frog. And then granted, we'll have the frog in the boat and come tournament time and we might deviate from this, but we're talking practice. By doing it that way, where you're fishing two, to, two of the same type of baits but differently, you comb that water column real quick. You know, you don't know if it's a chatter bait or a swim jig. You throw one, he throws the other. You'll know real quick. Boom, one's out. And it's all about in practice, eliminate, 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 eliminate. Because once there's nothing left, there's something in the lake that you catch them on. Well, technically, if you go through everything in practice, you'll find it. So if you have a question, just both of you fish it, and you'll get that elimination real quick. But if you're fishing both at the front of the boat, Yes. Guy's on the trolling motor, he's dictating the speed. You're using a crankbait as a, as a search bait or something to right. see what's going on. You don't want the guy next to you throwing a shaky hit where that thing Generally ends not. up yeah. all the way down exactly. back here. You both want to be, you know, yeah. swim jig. Yeah, you want to be on the same page. Something. If you think it's a good enough idea to throw a search bait, then both of you do it because then you can eliminate that idea. You know, if it's a good enough idea for one of you to do it, then both of you do it so you can figure out if it was a good idea. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it kind of makes sense. If I think it's a good idea for us to go flip, then let's figure out if flipping's worth doing. And the best way to do that is for both of us to do it so I can fish one half of a tree, you fish the other half of a tree, then we'll switch and we'll figure out if it was the bait or if it was where we were fishing. And if there's no luck at all, well, there wasn't anything on that tree. And again, or we're not going to catch them. We're talking free practice. <laughs> We're talking, we just got to the lake, we're trying to cover water. Once a tournament hits, we're not throwing the same thing. We're going to diversify because we've kind of narrowed down our spots and we're going to soak it a little bit more. But if he's throwing a crankbait and I'm throwing a jerkbait and it's our first day here, we're going to be able to get some follows or get some looks and cover some water. Now, if the horizontal approach isn't working and we're going to be flipping or going something a little bit slower, we'll diversify a little bit within that field. So, you know, a great example that I'm going to talk about later is power shotting. 
you know, I love power shotting where I'll take and I, I do a drop shot and a 15, 17 pound test on a massive flipping outfit because then I can put that where everyone else is flipping a one ounce weight, but I'm throwing them a drop shot and they've never seen that before. And mm -hmm. I can sit it there, soak it real quick. I know if I'm gonna get a bite. I, I always outfish guys with a power shot versus someone flipping. Well, I can throw that and then Billy can throw a jig in a tournament or something like that. So now we can both work that area pretty good, but we're not gonna mess up each other's pace. And do you wanna talk real quick about how you can fish fast effectively, not only with horizontal search baits, but also flipping? You know, generally, I'll let you expand on this, but generally when you think about fishing fast effectively, you think about using search baits like crank baits, mm -hmm. jerk baits, swim jigs, spinner baits, chatter baits, what have you, swim baits, all these other things where you're just chucking and winding. Well, you can fish fast flipping. And basically, you know, if you want to yeah. expand on that. And, and this is my flipping outfit right here. I use an eight, eight foot rod, uh, 25 pound test. Impossible to fit in a rod locker, by the way. <laughs> you gotta throw it in the truck. Uh, usually the weight I like to use, I like to use an ounce. One half is when I go real finesse when I'm practicing. The point is with that heavier weight, I can make more flips. And so when we talk about fish, fishing fast effectively with these type of baits, it's I'm not wasting time in between spots. If I'm fishing docks and I find out that they're only eating it on the backside of the dock, I don't want to fish the next five docks if they don't have that specific location. So I'll go to that one dock that has, that's not floating. Let's say they're on the wood pilings. I'm going to fish the wood piling docks. If there's three docks that are floating between, I haven't gotten a bite, I'm not going to fish it. I'm going to understand like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit this dock. I'm going to go find the next one. Plus, if you're dock fishing, sometimes you get areas where there's just a lot of dead water in between docks. There's no point in just moseying on over and throwing a search bait in between docks if you know there's not going to be a fish there, especially in a tournament. If you're in a tournament and you're on a dock bite and you know the exact type of dock and you have all the docks you want to hit waypointed and you're on docks right now, Hit the dock, hit it how you want to, put your trolling motor on 100 or use your big motor and get over to the next dock as fast as possible. You only have eight hours. So burn gas, do what you gotta do, but get to the next place where you actually want to fish. Don't just kind of mosey on over and throw in what you can just until you get there. Make it happen. And, and that's kind of what uh, fishing fast effectively with flipping is, is you can use vertical baits. You can even fish them slow when you're in there. You can use a drop shot, but then when you're done fishing that dock, get to the next dock as fast as possible and get it in the water. Yeah, yeah going back to teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work, everybody knows this. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. You don't want to hook each other. You want to make sure you're casting in efficient places. You don't want to be throwing the same bait in the same spot. Uh, you just want to complement each other. And a lot of that has to do with communication and how you position your boat and how you position yourselves in that boat and this is uh from the kiwi national championship last spring uh we ended up this was at two o'clock in the afternoon we didn't have a keeper yet and we were a little bit antsy at this point because we had a camera boat following us for the last hour they just left they gave up hope on us so we had spent the first few hours in the morning out looking for all of our deep spots as we spent all of practice convinced that we were going to catch them deep. Really didn't happen. And so, tournament came along, didn't have anything at 1.30. We're like, okay, this has got to change. We got to go shallow. So we went shallow and we just started looking for beds. Well, we found one, had a five pounder on it, and she was locked on. So he has more experience sight fishing than I do. So I just gave it to him. We backed off, we left for 15 minutes, and then we came back and we knew exactly where the bed was. So we snuck along the bank on one side, power pulled down about 20 yards away. We knew where the bed was. We could faintly make it out. We couldn't really see the fish though. Uh, so then I was just standing there with my hands in my pockets. That's, this is exactly what happened. And he had a couple rods that he was cycling through just to try to irritate the fish. Long story short, he got it to eat and we caught the five pounder and then in the next two hours we ended up catching 12 pounds of fish and we made it happen we were in good position for the last day we didn't make it happen but it was it was a good moral story anyway because in the end you're a team so it doesn't matter if you're the one that catches the fish in that situation i had my hands in my pockets and i was just as involved as if i were the one trying to catch the fish because in the end you get to hold the fish up too 
Even if you catch nothing and your partner catches five that weigh 18 pounds, well, guess what? He can't hold them all. So you get to, you get to contribute at least. You know, I got to take my picture with the five pounder he caught, so it made me happy. Uh, but th that's really the moral to the story with team fishing is you're doing it and your fish go together. You know, you don't keep them in separate boxes like you would if you were a boater and a, a co-angler. You're together, so act like it. We like to fish fast. <laughs> uh, I think it's apparent with us showing a bunch of pictures with us on riprap and all that other stuff and talking about throwing crankbaits and jerkbaits and all this other stuff, but there are a lot of different ways to be successful. Kevin Van Dam really likes to move fast. Brian Thrift probably moves faster than anybody else on tour. And you know, he, he actually burns through both tanks every day of practice and every day of the tournament. Because it just like the fish fast effectively thing, that was actually a quote from, uh, from an article written on him where his cameraman wrote it about him. And it really just shows that the common thinking of you have to soak baits and catch every fish that's in front of you isn't necessarily true. You can catch every fish that's willing to be caught and then just find all the fish in the lake that are willing to be caught. You can do it that way. Or you can do it the way where you can catch every one in Twayer and only get those five bites. And you can win that way. Andy Morgan does that. He's pretty darn successful. He goes where nobody else goes and he locks a stick worm in his hands and he catches 25 pounds doing that where he gets five bites because those are the only five fish that were there and he caught them. There's a heck of a lot of ways to be successful in this sport and you got to figure out what works for you. Because uh, Gerald Swindle said this on uh, Bass Live or Ike Live or whichever live uh, he was talking. He said that, uh, you know, I was fishing a tournament and I knew it was going to be one out deep, but it, it wasn't going to be one out deep by me. So you, you got to really know what you're capable of doing and what you're good at and, you know, make it work for you. I don't know if you want to add to that. I mean, yeah, we're not professionals, you know, you know, we're not getting paid millions of dollars. We haven't been doing this for a living. This is just kind of what, what we've been able to apply and be able to be successful at. We tried it the other way and we just could never make it work. And I guess that's my biggest thing to the young anglers in the room is do what's comfortable to you and make that work. You know, if you like flipping a one ounce weight, there are guys that do that all over the country. If you like throwing just spinning reels, you can do that. You know, develop something that you have confidence in. So wherever you go in the country, it's like, I'll make this work for me. You know, you might not want to move at all. That's fine. You can do that. So I guess as you're growing up, and especially when I grew up as an angler, don't listen to everyone tell you how you have to fish to be successful and make it get you down. Like, I, I clearly can't go out there and, and catch them because I don't do it the way everyone tells me to. And that's not true. Just work hard and, be, and develop your own image as an angler and get confidence in that. And as long as you have confidence in your abilities, you know, you can actually, do, you can do really good in this sport. You got another slide? Oh, we got way too many slides. Let's go faster. Okay, we're not gonna spend too much time on this at all. Kiss, keep it simple, stupid. You know, don't overthink stuff. You gather all this information. That's just to give you a toolbox so that on game day when it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you haven't caught a fish, you have an idea of what to do, okay? And managing the internal voices. Eliminating water really helps come tournament day because you know where not to fish, mm -hmm. which is something that is very underrated as a tournament angler. Knowing where to fish is almost... I'd almost argue it's less important than knowing where not to fish. If I know that I'm not going to catch them deep, and I'm not going to catch them on docks, and I'm not going to catch them in grass, the only thing left is wood, I, I, that's what I'm doing tournament day. It's just simple as that. Move on. Yeah, only consonants, nothing stays the same, self-explanatory. Moving on, let's, let's talk about lake fishing and baits we use. Okay, so we already talked about jerk baits. Anytime the water's clear, and there's bait fish in the lake like shad, I'm going to throw a jerk bait because I feel like I can catch some fish. And especially in practice and pre-practice when my goal is to get out there and find them, that is what I like to do. So I love jerk baits. These are all jerk baits. There's a lot in here. And that's because, you know, I like to have different colors and I kind of have a problem with tackle warehouse. But, uh, yeah, so that, that's what I like to throw in lakes. Tommy? Yeah, I mean, my, my selection is a little different. Yeah, the, the thing that I really got into when I was younger was throwing big, uh, big swim baits. And then when I got into tournaments, I really downsized. 
Um, this right here has put a lot of fish in my boat. You know, it does work on the Potomac. Uh, it, it works great on the Shenandoah, but this thing is dynamite on lakes. This right here is a Caltech uh, version of this. This is a, a three inch swim bait. When you're fishing swim baits, at least what I've seen is people go too big. They think you look at California. If I throw a shoe in the water, I'm going to catch a 10 pounder. It's like, dude, this is a pond. Like, now, to they're quantify not there. that, there are lakes on the East Coast where throwing a bigger swim bait is yeah. successful. It's just not every lake. <laughs> okay. Yeah, shad, a little threadfin shad, man, he's probably a little bit smaller than this. And that's what the fish are used to feeding on. It's the same thing when we went to Indian. We caught them on a one, like a 1 1.0 square bill. Yep. They would not hit a two. They wouldn't hit a 1.5. They wanted this little peanut. And that's when they started spitting up. I was like, oh, they're eating these little things. You know, big fish will eat a big meal, but if everything in the lake is this one size, they get kind of conditioned to that. And that's kind of what I've seen with swim baits. A lot of people just throw them too big. This here might be a little too big. If what they're eating is a little smaller than that, the big fish got big for a reason. And they get conditioned to eating that food source that's available. It's no different than deer. You know, if alfalfa is in, they know that has the most nutrients, they're going to go look for that. If a largemouth knows that there's a lot of crayfish in the area, he's keyed on that. And so, you know, this right here, I really like fishing uh, mostly as a spinnerbait, as a substitute for spinnerbait in the clear waters. Claytor Lake, uh, Smith Mountain Lake, definitely all the blueback places. This has really started to take place the spinnerbait for me a lot. And I like to throw this on like 15 pound test sunline with seven foot rod. And you just, it's stupid simple. You just go slow and just slowly work it. Um, the last bit of it is the hook. You, you got to use a paper thin hook because a lot of the fish, at least in this area, they come up and they'll swipe at it or they'll just inhale it. And by the time you feel them, if you try to whack them like you're flipping, it pops out. You got to almost treat this like a crankbait. And if you get a very thin hook, when they eat that and it loads, it'll puncture with less weight. If you're fishing like one of those big old like shark gamagatsu swim bait hooks, by the time you feel that fish, if you just try to put a little pressure on them, there's not enough pressure that you can put on that fish because he's there. If you go with a paper thin hook like this, once you once that rod loads, that weight will put that right into his mouth. Um, also to kind of add to that, something important when you're downsizing swim baits, the hollow bellies have a much thicker plastic, so it doesn't allow the, the tail to really kick on the much smaller versions. So like Bass mm -hmm. Tricks or uh, some of the Yum Shadalicious swim baits that have really, really thick plastic. When they're small, they don't work. And you can make them work by tearing some of the stuff and modifying them. But that's why when you're going with smaller ones, I recommend the, the softer body swim baits, not the hollow bellies, because uh, it, it allows the tail to wiggle regardless of how small they are. Uh, so it's something to think about. With the bigger swim baits, hollow bellies are great. You know, I throw hollow bellies all the time. But another thing that I love to fish because I refuse to fish slow in most circumstances, even when it's 30 degrees outside, is I bring out the underspin. Now, Casey Ashley is a god with this thing, and he proved it in the last uh, Hartwell tournament, or the Hartwell Classic. Was it last year? It was three years ago, I think. Two years? I, I don't know. Two, Two years, years ago for the Hartwell Classic? Yeah, okay. So he was there, and he lapped the field with this thing because uh, they were keying in on bluebacks, and it was about 20 degrees outside and snowing and hailing and just misery but he was catching them on this thing. And the key is this little blade here. In the, in the cold weather, bass don't see very well. They don't see very well at all. I, I don't know what the deal is with their eyes or whatnot. You can Google, you know, I'm not a marine biologist, but I know for a fact that they don't see very well. So this little bit of blade affects their lateral line and it helps them find this bait. And you'll notice the same thing if you're throwing an umbrella rig. It doesn't work in warmer water because they can see the wires. They don't see the wires in the colder water because they don't see very well. Uh, so I like to throw this thing wherever it is deep and clear and there are bait fish. Because the fish generally go down in those uh, creek channels and all that other stuff and they sit below the bait and then whenever the bait comes over they ambush. The key to throwing this thing is you cannot work it too slow. It is physically impossible. You need to have no pulse in order to fish this thing. And which is why I have a little bit more success with it than he does. Because <laughs> <laughs> when he's whining, he's whining. Me, you do about, let's see if this thing wrapped. Uh, anyway, okay. You do about a quarter turn a second. I, my hand goes this fast. Everybody can see that. I go this fast when I'm throwing an underspin. It is painful. 
It'll take about four or five minutes per cast mm -hmm. if I'm getting a good cast in, because you need to cast it as long as possible. But I think I have a picture on here. Oh yeah, we talked about some stuff. Oh, oh, you can barely see it. That's a six and a half pounder. I caught a kiwi on this thing, and uh, just to kind of prove that it does work. And what made it really, really fun in that situation is we were practicing. There was a tournament going on at the time, a local tournament, and there were boats fishing all around us, and they weren't catching a darn thing. And we just pulled up on this point. We sat there for a few minutes, and I was just winding it back, just bouncing it along the bottom. I would lose contact. I'd let it fall back down to the bottom, keep it going, and it just loads up. It just loads up, and, and nothing happens. And Tom's like, are you hung up? I'm like, no, I got one. And it just started going sideways. You know, the whole deal where it doesn't start coming to you, it starts going away from you, and you're like, oh, okay. You know, I don't usually have my drag set on this thing because I'm down deep, but he was pulling it. And, and, this, and this comes back to we're talking about team fishing. I am terrible at underspin. He's good. This was a point that we found with the jerk baits. We caught a couple of small ones. We knew there were fish there. So I said, Bill, you got the front of the boat. I'm going to take a shake again. I'm going to get back here. Wherever you want to hit with that thing, go. Because I knew that was the most effective bait. And I wasn't very good at it, but he was. So I let him have the front, and he had whatever angle he wanted so he could work that thing effectively. And then I would just hit the little side areas with the shaky head at the time. And so uh, and that kind of gets back to the team thing. If you have a guy that's really good at something, dude, let him, your team, let him have it. If you know that's the situation, let him do it. And then you try to help him out in any way possible. Yeah, we're fishermen. We go on tangents. I'm sorry. To finish up the story, though, caught a six and a half pounder, showed it to three other boats that were fishing a tournament, released it. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get to the title. Okay. Stuff. Yeah. Tournament day. Uh, basically, take uh, all the information that you've gathered, hold on to it, but don't get way too involved in making your game plan. Don't plan out every second of your day because nothing ever goes according to the plan in bass fishing. You know, you may have an hour where things are working out, and those are the days where you win. But a lot of days you got to kind of pull stuff together at the last second so don't get too focused on what happened yesterday because today's a new day so have a plan of how you're going to start and how you're going to attack things but be ready to change and you use you, you change based on the stuff that you've learned from your study so now we're going to talk about rivers and this one's going to go much faster because we fish rivers all the time uh pre-fishing tidal water <laughs> learn your tides it's important um one thing I'm just going to throw out now, actually I'll, I'll, I'll wait on it because we have a tide slide, I'll stay to the program. We're going to talk about tides, we're going to talk about current, types of cover, and whatever else it says on the board. So Billy and I grew up fishing tidal. Um, we started fishing the, the tidal Potomac River when we were 10, and we just fished it all the way through. Um, we've, always, we've always cut a check or something on, on the Potomac River, and I don't like it. it it's, the tide is really weird. Tidal fishing can be some of the greatest fishing and it can be some of the hardest fishing because you have to understand tide is God. If God is not happy, you're not going to catch anything. God's got to be willing to give you what you need. And that makes practicing a lot harder as well. When you're on a lake, Chesapeake, yeah, or Chesapeake, or the Potomac, or um, the Delta, but when you're fishing a lake, James. you can pretty much go anywhere you want to and you can, pro you can make something happen. The problem when you're pre-fishing a tidal body where you've never been to, if the tide is not right and you've got a terrible tide and you're there, that could be the greatest spot in the world. And so you got to be comfortable enough to say, like, this is a good spot. I'm just not here right now. I won't catch anything. And that's what I think when a lot of college teams have come into our area and ask, like, what do you need to do? It's like, you got you to gotta go to a spot and just know if the tide's not right, it might be a great spot, but there's nothing there and have confidence to go back. And so that will definitely affect how you practice for a, a tidal water fishery. Yeah, when you're practicing for tidal, tidal water, same principles apply as when you're fishing lakes, all the stuff that you would research on lakes, you're gonna research on tidal also, but you're gonna research tides in addition. So, you know, just a little bit more. You know, it's very similar though. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways, I know Tom wants to talk about this, is just patterns really don't exist on tidal. They just don't. Lakes, you can get on a pattern where they're in bushes and, you know, clay banks, and you can go around the lake and duplicate that. It's really not the same with tidal. I mean, sure, you can get on a thing where you're like, my pattern is grass. It's like, okay, well, the entire body of water is grass. So, you know, okay, they're on docks. It's like, okay, that's that's fine. Which docks? You know, we don't know. So patterns really don't happen. It's much more spot related. You get certain areas that are just better than other areas. They have, you know, 
shells on the ground and grass or they have a hard bottom or there's just some little difference that you can't duplicate elsewhere. So I don't know if you want to expand on that at all. I mean, yeah, I mean, you hit it pretty well. I can tell you all the great spots in Potomac and I'll meet you out there. Aquia, <laughs> the beach, Piscataway, Belmont Bay, and I'll see you there. There'll be a thousand other boats. The problem with tidal, and if you've seen any major tournament there, is it is because the population has really shrunk into these smaller areas, everyone's going to be there. And so it's not as much like, okay, we're going to go to Aquia with the 90 other boats. Yeah, but now it's like we have to find the subtle nuances within that area. Um, the other thing is, there are two main types, and if you guys listen to Bass Live or, or Bass University or Iconelli or anything like that about doing milk runs, I'm not very comfortable with doing milk runs. I have tried, and every time I've failed miserably. <laughs> Tidal water is the only time Billy and I won't move. Once yeah. we're on our area, we will power pull down our sit there. We'll sit there for nine hours. We don't care. We will not move once you're on the spot because it's about hitting that prime time and grinding through an area. If I'm on this grass bed at this big, and I know there's enough weight there for four days, I'm not moving because it's, I got to hit it that right point. And all it takes is for a couple minutes to pass and that tide gets right and you can load a boat. When we fish the Chesapeake, it's our first time on the Chesapeake, uh, our, first, our first FLW tournament. Talk actually. about pre-fishing on the Chesapeake. Talk about that. For that one right there, what we did is we went up to the flat area and we tried to fish that a couple of times and we caught a few, but it wasn't consistent. And being our first tournament, I didn't want a goose egg. <laughs> I had a terrible jersey. We were from a school that didn't matter, and I was nervous about this. So I was like, let's just go find something that we could catch fish on. So I went into Pond Creek, and I did a little pre-fishing there. And what I did is I basically based my pre-fishing that I would hit each place on the best tide. Granted, this is only working if you have the time to donate, but I was like, okay, I'm going to go here when I know the tide's going to be right, right, so I know there's fish there. So I went to Pond Creek, and we fished a little bit, caught them. All right, good. This is where we're going to go. We go day one of the tournament. We get out there. We blast up to their spot. A couple of people there like, they're there. They're fishing our spot. They went right over our spot. Problem was, they didn't know the tide situation. They, the tide was pulling out, okay? The tide was pulling out, and they were casting that way. And so they were pulling it against the current. And Billy and I looked at each other, and the light bulb went Ooh. off. And like, oh, they didn't, they didn't hit it right. So what we did, as soon as we just sat there, we waited, we waited. It was a little early. We went around, and we fished, casting into the current. First time went by, nothing, that's okay. We got 10 minutes. Went back around, went back through there again. 16 pounds, one pass. We were done, we went somewhere else to call. It's just, that's tidal fishing. You gotta have the confidence that they're there, it's just not supper time yet. And understand what that current's doing. If you're looking down and that grass is bowing like that, there is no point making a cast across that because that fish is going to lay up in that hydrilla or milfoil when it's he's- so far ahead right now. Oh, I am? I will get speed <laughs> We didn't even talk about tides. So let's get back to tides. I was just going to skip it. You're talking about grass, so we got a slide for it. Go ahead. Oh, there you go. Lose your mind. No, okay. Uh, yeah, breaking down tidal water, most tidal rivers, James, Potomac, those are the ones you're going to be fishing in this area. They're big. It's 40 miles from Aquia Creek up into Alexandria. And you can catch fish the whole way. You know, it's even longer if you want to go to Nanjamoy, but I don't recommend it. Uh, so what you do is you look at what the locals are saying and honestly what the locals are saying is incredibly important on tidal water because it is such a spot based situation. Now there are little honey holes like Justin Lucas wanted up in DC on a big dock but you know every local knows that that dock exists they just didn't think that it would hold up for four days mm -hmm. and it did and he won because he got 20 something pounds a day but no one else was fishing it so the, the planets aligned for him you know everybody else who was in the top 10 or top 15, they were fishing spots that everybody knows of. Jason Christie came in second place, caught 26 pounds on the final day, and he was fishing Piscataway. He had his power poles down the entire day fishing the grass. He didn't move. And he fished that exact same spot every single day, and he power pulled down every single day, because that's what tidal water does, it replenishes. That doesn't happen on lakes. Lakes, you find a great dock, you go catch your fish, great, okay, well, you may be able to come back later if it is an insanely good dock and catch another good one. But chances are, you're going to catch your fish, go find another dock because you caught that resident fish. On tidal, it's not that way. Oh. Uh -oh. You can talk about yeah, this first. Go ahead and talk about tides. <laughs> Who here has like a Lawrence or Hummingbird or something like that on your boat? Raise your hand. Okay. You got Hummingbird, Lawrence. Okay. Um, I run Lowrance and they have a really cool feature where you have tide charts on it. And it'll actually give you up to the minute tide charts while you're fishing. 
I, a lot of times, will turn my sonar off and just leave that on the front of my boat. And I'll just watch the tides that ebb and flows. And I'll get, I'll get to this in a minute. The reason I want to do that is I want to have the clock right here telling me where the tide is. But every time I catch a fish, I'm making a mental note of where that was. Because from that point in time, tides change every day. Okay, it gets later every day. So if I catch it at 2 o'clock, I know the next day it's probably going to be about 2.05 that that sweet spot might be. But that way I can kind of pattern them, if there is a way to pattern on title, on when I'm catching them. Um, a person that did this to great success was Aaron Martins when he won on the right. Chesapeake. He literally just stared at his gauge, too. And you know, he, he blew up a huge secret because now everyone knows about it. But he just watched it. He's like, nope, they're not right. It's not right. It's not right. Boom, he wins the tournament as soon as it gets right. That helps me as an angler when I'm in a tournament have confidence. It's one thing when you're looking at a little paper, but when you're watching the time get down, you're getting close to the time, it's okay. It's like, all right, I've only got five more minutes. I have to wait and be patient, and then everything's going to be good. And so that's one little tip that might help you on tidal water is if you have the ability with your electronics, get that gauge up there and just have it available all day and track it. And that'll get you a little bit better at reading the tides, and when you start getting your bites, you can start piecing them together when they're hitting. Because if they're hitting at a very certain point within that low tide or high tide period, you can have that available in the back of your mind so you're on your prime spot just when you have to be there. Yeah, a couple, uh, couple tips and uh, topics that we want to talk about real quick because we're running out of time. Uh, positioning. Fish position themselves in current. They don't swim backwards. I don't know if you guys knew that. Bass don't really swim very well backwards. They can kind of back up a little bit with their tiny little side fins or whatever. But they generally swim forwards. So in order to not get blown down current, they have to swim into the current. So that means if you are also going with the current, you're casting down current and bringing it back up, you're hitting him in the butt. He's not seeing it. Okay? You, you may be able to get a reaction strike or something if you hit him with it, but he's not seeing the bait come. Okay? Because usually bait fish aren't swimming that direction either. They're going with the current. So it's important to keep your boat going against the current when you're casting a bait. When you're flipping, you can get away with it a little bit more because it's usually falling vertical. But if you're casting a bait, have your boat positioned into the current. That way you're casting your bait, bringing it with the current, because the fish are going to be looking that direction. So if you see the grass bent over this way, you want to be fishing that way, because the fish are going to be tucked underneath that grass, swimming into the current so they can stay hidden. So you're going to want to bring the bait past the grass in the front of it so that they can see it coming, and, the, and you, you just catch a lot more fish doing that. That's what happened at Chesapeake that he was talking about earlier. Uh, they made a pass going in the wrong direction. We made a pass going in the right direction. We came in third place in the tournament. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing, on docks, they'll do the same thing. They will position themselves on the downstream part of it, facing up into it. They'll get on the pillars, hiding behind it, use it as their cover, as a current break and whatnot. It's the same deal. Uh, yeah, with grass, you have uh, jetties. Lisavania is one of the most famous jetties that I can think of because. You, all the fish are released there from you know, every tournament that goes out of Lisavania, dumps fish right there. They all go out to the rocks. So everybody fishes the rocks. But a lot of people don't fish them right because they don't fish the correct direction in different tides. Okay, so same thing with boat positioning applies here. You want to cast into the current and bring it with the current. You don't want to cast and bring it against the current. It just doesn't work out. You will catch so many more fish going against the current as you will going with it. Then we did all that? Uh, what are we doing on time? Time to talk about minutes, questions. Minutes, questions, yeah. questions baits. We'll, we'll talk about baits if you don't have any questions. Any questions at all? Yes, sir. I've talked to a lot of fishermen about this question. When, when these tournaments are over, when you come into the weigh-in, a lot of fish get released from one spot. Yeah. What normally happens to those fish? Do they hang in, in that area, or do they try to migrate back to where they were caught, or does it take weeks or months? What's a good general rule of thumb? Should you fish those areas where those fish are released for the next couple of days or not even waste your time fishing them like around the marina where they're released? That's always been a question for me. Always a good idea to fish marinas. Always a good idea because there is a population of fish that live there. Because there are fish that do migrate back. In, in my experience, again, this is all my opinion. You know, I'm not a marine biologist. But in my experience, no fish... No two fish are exactly the same. You know, they're a little bit different, each one of them. You know, same thing with deer, same thing with dogs and horses and all kinds of animals. Each one's a little bit different and they behave differently. So when a bunch of fish are released there, a few hundred after a tournament, 
Some are going to migrate back. They'll migrate different ways. Some are going to stay. You know, it, it, they're different fish. You know, but if 200 fish are released a couple days ago, not all 200 are leaving. You know, there's definitely going to be some fish there. So that's actually one thing that happens on tidal water a lot is areas where fish are released actually get pretty darn good because they don't want to have to fight the tides all the way back. So Mattawoman, Leesylvania are always really stacked places because the fish are all released there. And this happens a lot on the Chesapeake too because there's so yep. much salt content they can't leave. Yep. Like the fish that were caught out of the Middle River, they can't go back there. Never get back. There might be too much salt salinity in the water where they would die. Mm -hmm. So on tidal, you'll see that a lot where Mattawoman will just always be good as long as there are tournaments there because that's 500 fish or more that are get dumped back in there. And that's home. Um, it might be a little bit if you go down to uh, Lake Anna. I think uh, Sturgeon Marina is one place that has a lot of tournaments. Um, they'll probably disperse a little bit more there than on necessarily a, a tidal river system. Um, and then I guess the one thing I add, if nobody has any questions, is when you're fishing tide, one thing I found out is a lot of people don't get finessey enough, in my opinion. Um, a lot of times you will have, if we fish like a Potomac Teams or BFL, on the Potomac, you literally have just, it's boats everywhere. And that's because this is where, this is their spawning ground, this is where they're at. Um, and a lot of times you'll see everyone, they're throwing a chatterbait, uh, they're throwing a swim jig. Uh, you can catch those fish that other people miss by just thinking outside the box a little bit. And you know, I'm going to show you guys two things that I do, and this is where I really started, was just with the power shot. Um, this right here is, I just take a, I don't know, I think it's a VMC J hook. And then I attach this to 15, 17 pound test fluorocarbon. And I just go straight fluorocarbon with this. And how I do that is I just go with a much bigger reel. And with this setup right here, I can flip marina docks. I can flip that massive hydrilla because I'm making short little pitches, but I can keep that right in the area. And I don't have any problem with break offs. The other thing I like to do, especially if, if they're hitting a Senko and they stop, this here is something I actually made. Um, this is a bladed Senko. There is literally nothing you can buy to make this. You have to jerry rig it yourself. What I do, and I use this on Indian a lot, and when the bike gets really tough in Florida, you want to put a 3 out or a 3.5 blade right on your Senko and attach it. What this acts like is a flutter spoon. And I have outfished almost everybody that's doing a flipping deal in grass or lily pads with this bait. Because what happens when that thing falls, in the water and that fish is tucked in that lily pad like that and I pull that up it pulsates and flutters down pulsates and flutters down and so if I'm fishing a hydrilla a hydrilla bed and they're in the pre-spawn and they're all in there they've seen rattle trap they've seen a, a chatter bait they've seen all this but then I can take that bait and I can pull it and it's gonna right up and it's just gonna flutter right back down their face pull it right up and flutter right back down their face um, on Indian we didn't catch a darn thing in the pads until that, that's when he made this thing was in the pads and as soon as he made it first cast two and a half pounder it, you know so the proof is in the pudding it actually works because fish don't see it you know it's, it's something different and that just gets back down to just being a little meticulous if you're fishing tidal stuff a lot of times we're all there you know yeah. the beach at, down at Aquia, that's where most of that population spawns is in that that big grass flat everyone's there we're all going to be there well if all of us are throwing a chatterbait the fish are going to get turned off to that there's got to be something different um a Nico rig is something I started experimenting with where I would throw just a, a stupid little Nico rig. If, has everyone heard of the Nico rig before? Okay. I started and the flipping, Ned rig. The Ned rig, but I started flipping, you know, the, the Nico rig around and I started catching when no one else was. Everyone else was punching. Why? They haven't seen it. They're so used to these power techniques and they get beat on all the time that just by going to something like finesse stuff on tidal and all of a sudden it turns a bite on. So I guess that would be my last little tidbit for tidal water is just if you're looking around and everyone's doing the same thing, you know, think what can you do a little differently? You know, those fish are feeling all those same vibrations of the lateral line. Everyone's throwing that Z-Man chatterbait. Uh-huh. Wait, there's a little worm right there. That's different. They're going to hit that. Yeah, but all in all, do keep it simple on tidal water. It's really not that complicated as far as where the fish are and what the fish are eating. Uh, we had a friend his first year. He, he fished for Virginia Tech. He grew up next to us, and he, all he does is fish a stick worm. And we told him, you just do you because that's how you catch them on the title. Just fish a stick worm, fish a chatterbait, swim jig, spinnerbait, and uh, what's the third one? There's a holy triad, crankbait, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there's like five baits to throw on title that are guaranteed to catch you fish. So just don't get crazy. They work. Um, and just go to the areas where the fish are. 
because uh, they're there. You know, you're going to be brushing up against other people a lot of times. But you know, outside of that, you can find other spots that other people haven't found. They're few and far between on title, but they do exist. So don't be afraid to experiment, but also know that sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. So uh, if there's no questions, I believe that's it. Any other questions? Questions. You have a 40 weight spinning rod or spinning reel. Yep. And you're spooled up with 15 pounds. 15, pound 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. Yep. What? Every time I've done that, it just blows off. Of See, that's why you have a giant reel and you do not, yeah, I have a 40 like don't that. spool it all the way. And you got to leave. You got to leave a good bit left and you have to boil it. Now, okay. what boiling does is it, it reduces the life of your fluorocarbon, but it keeps it on your spool and keeps it from getting that line twist. Because um, we've all been there, you, you spool it up, first cast, the whole reel comes off. And it'll, yeah, it's just utter misery. Now, one thing I do with most of my spinning rods is I do use backing. You know, I do use floor, or I do use a braid to fluorocarbon backing. Um, and we'll be around here if anybody wants to know what knots we use or anything like that, we can show you. Um, and if I could add to that, I very rarely cast that. I use that as a flipping stick, a yeah. finesse flipping stick. When I'm using most of my flipping stuff, I'll use braid to leader, but I'm going to use like a 25 pound test leader to the braid. I get a little queasy if I'm using that kind of that kind of leader material with lighter line and I'm that close. Because there have been some times I've, I've flipped into the thing, shake, catch, that's a six pounder right there. I get a little nervous about that. And so I like just to go straight through. There are no extra knots, I don't have to worry about it. And I can control it a lot more. When I flip it there and it was it hits the mono and then it hits that braid, it tends to scoot as soon as the, the, the yeah. eyes hit the braid. It wants to go a little faster. When I just use pure fluorocarbon, it's a little bit slower. So I can really control my flips and my pitches with that. And so basically that's just that's my finesse version of using a flipping stick with a drop yeah. shot around cover. It's all personal preference too with the fluorocarbon and braid and, and the leaders and all this other stuff. Personally, if I do a leader, I like to make sure my knot doesn't come out of my leader. You know, if that makes sense. So if I have braid backing, I like to tie it in so far back that I can spool up enough fluorocarbon that if I'm flipping, it doesn't get to the knot. Because if I am using 60 pound braid and a 25 pound fluorocarbon leader, I don't want to risk that knot being the thing that breaks. You know, I, I have faith in my knots, but in a tournament, I don't want the knot to be the thing that breaks. So I want as little to po as possible to go wrong. So I like to spool it up past that point. So if I'm making a long flip, the braid backing is still on my reel, you know? So that's just a personal preference thing. A lot of people do like seven feet so that the the, uh, the leader's outside of their rod so that it doesn't hit the eyelets. Um, but, you know, it, it's really a personal preference thing. So, yes, sir. Is there anything that determines what length of rod is uh, Your height is really important. I know with a jerk bait, I use a 6.6 six medium heavy rod because uh, I don't want it to give at all and it's graphite. Uh, but because the big problem is when you're using a jerk bait, if you use too long a rod, you're gonna hit the water uh, when you're using that jerk bait. Yeah. And then when you're flipping, honestly, with flipping, it's really just whatever you want to use. Uh, using a longer rod makes it so that you can pick up a lot more line at once. So if you're making long flips, uh, you can just do one crank of the rod and you have all of your line mm -hmm. back to set the hook. So it makes it just easier and it makes it so you can make longer pitches and more accurate pitches because the rod is so long. I think they're actually lifting the uh, the regulations. Now you can use pretty much as long of a rod you want. 10, ten, ten foot? feet? 10 feet, okay. I mean, I would not want a rod longer than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Honestly, eight feet is a bit extreme. To, just to piggyback, I know we're running out of time to piggyback on what Billy said. If you're fishing a jerk bait, Billy and I have, used, have been in tournaments where we fish a jerk bait 10 hours straight. It's exhausting, by if the way. If you take the jerk bait and you work left and right, you will be dead in an hour. The key with it when you're working that thing all day is to go up and down. Okay, that's a lot less fatiguing on your body. Um, especially if you get into smallmouth country, like when we were up Chautauqua or Cayuga and we're just looking for smallmouth, this is a lot easier to do for seven hours versus going left and right. And that's where having that smaller rod is easier. If you have a nine foot rod or a seven foot rod and you do that, you're gonna hit the water almost every time. So if you're a shorter individual, you know, go down to even a five foot rod if you have to, but that way you can put the proper action on the bait. And that's the same thing. If you're flipping docks and you want a roll cast, I'm not going to do that with my eight foot rod. I have another flipping stick at home that's about, I think it's like 6'10 and really stout. I'll use that in tighter areas because then I can get that rod tip lower when I'm making my pitches. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, if you're fishing marinas on tidal, 
you can't use a long rod. You know, I brought out my medium heavy jerk bait rod when we were fishing a marina on the Chesapeake because you can fit a boat in there, but if you want to flip underneath the dock, you got to get really, really small and try to flip in there. You don't have a bunch of space to really get in there. You know, so it, it depends on the situation that you're trying to fish. And to answer your question, it's ma mainly personal preference and what works for you because before we had these huge rods, people were flipping with six footers and doing just fine. So you can make it work for you. So just, you know, whatever works for you. I have one quick question. We got uh, Frederick County uh, bass wranglers here in Berkeley Springs also came down though. Thanks for bringing them. Uh, what advice would you give the young kids about opportunities that they have now? Us older folk, we didn't have this opportunity back in the day, but uh, just real quick, the opportunities that they have if they love this uh, sport of fishing, <coughs> the opportunities they have beyond high school even. Biggest thing I'd say guys is you have Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I cannot tell you how much how important that is. There's you got Bass University, you got Wired to Fish. Anything you want to know about fishing, you can find. If you've never fished deep muddy water before because you live in a clear reservoir, but you might have that opportunity. Just Google it. There's a video on it. You can <laughs> learn almost anything, and you can keep your mind engaged. The one thing I see a lot with young anglers, and they're like, if they're not fishing, they're not thinking about it. I've watched every iClide podcast like twice. I'm up on everything. And so I know what the hot trends are. You want to know what a hot trend is? Tackle Warehouse has a best-selling list per month. You can find out what the pros are fishing because everyone in the country, if they buy something, it'll show you what's peaking. I knew when the Whopper Plopper became big because even the pros have to buy it. They have to keep it a secret, but they got to buy it from somewhere. So even just little things like that, if you keep staying in the loop with everything, you're going to keep your mind set on it. And that makes a huge difference in once you get back on the game. If you just fish and then unplug, you're not keeping your mind sharp. This game is constantly changing with different techniques, different strategies, how people are winning. And so as long as you keep your mind sharp and constantly learn, it's going to it's going to prove such big dividends. I am not I don't think myself as a really good angler. I'm better than I was when I first started college and then I'm better than I was when I first started high school because I didn't say I'm just I want to learn. And if I keep that humble thing that no matter what, I'm going to constantly learn. I'm going to learn from my failures. I'm going to learn from my success. I'm not going to get too high. And if you keep that up, you're going to be great in the sport because you're going to get your butt kicked. Yeah. I've gotten my butt kicked. Okay. Every national championship, day two <laughs> never went great. We fished multi day tournaments at regionals and state level. Never a problem. But for some reason, once we got to the national championship, all the stuff we found didn't work and we couldn't get it or a hook would break. And it stinks getting on stage and saying that. But guess what? That's fishing. Baseball, if you guys are baseball fans, and I, I teach baseball for a living right now, to be a successful hitter, if you bat 250, you're in the major leagues. If you're Danny Espinoza and he is a terrible hitter, he bats 150, you're still getting a couple million dollar check. Congratulations. You're failing a lot in this sport and you will fail and fail and fail. If you fall in love with the failures and you let that motivate you to keep going and keep trying, the opportunities are there. But just you got to keep grinding and keep learning. Yeah, last thing I want to say, we mentioned it very, very briefly. Download Google Earth. Google Earth is your best friend if you're going to a new body of water. You can see all the docks on the lake. You can see all the clay points on places where that's important. You can even see laydowns. You can see all the riprap on the lake. So you can go to places with waypoints already in mind. So it's just really, really important that downloading Google Earth, just do it. Okay, just do that. Hey boys, that's fun homework. Yeah, like it's free. Man. It's free too. Just download it. I want to thank these guys. Everybody give them a round of applause. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, before we do, we'll bring back uh, Jeff Luger. Before we do, a couple quick things. Uh, February 25th, Britt Stoudemire from New River Guide. Uh, he'll be here. Uh, apologize for those stands. How many we give? We're probably going to do that one in the back and have plenty of chairs. Uh, so make sure you come back next month, February 25th. 50-50, uh, if you didn't get your tickets, get those now. Uh, half will go to winter, half will go to these guys in the Frederick County Wranglers. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, your white ticket, if you didn't get that, get that put in there for some door prizes over here. I uh, want to give a shout out to Jenkins Jigs, they donate some jigs for us. Uh, Ricky Landis, uh, Big Bass Daddy Custom Baits, he's right over here, see him. Uh, as well, Dwayne Holler is up from Middle uh, uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh with uh, Double D Jigs. Uh, so he's here as well. Um, any other last, they'll be around here if you have any questions. Uh, take a 10, 15 minute break. Coffee's here, food in the back, drinks, restrooms. Uh, we'll be back 10 to 15 minutes and bring Jeff Luger on. Thank you. Yeah,
A lot of information. Just oh, yeah. so much information.